Let me start with this. Jesus said in John's uh, account, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Not that they're going to get it. They have eternal life. They'll never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. What a, what a great message. What great news. And this morning, you either sit there going, great, I, I've done that. I, I know that. I have eternal life. Or you're looking at that saying, I'm not sure. And we'll give you an opportunity at the very end to be able to receive that yourself. So allow me to pray, and we'll get into our, our message this morning. Lord, we find out that you, Christ, are right in the midst of our crisis. Whatever we're going through, you're there for us. You're not there just in the happy times and the joyful times, but matter of fact, you seem to be even more there, or it's clear that you're more present when we're hurting. And we thank you for always showing up, and we know that you're there, and you're never going to leave Never leave us alone. We thank you for that, God. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, you would speak to us this morning. Thank you for your time to be able to sing and worship you in song. And now we worship you in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, grab my little clicker here. Our message this morning is pretty simple. Two graves and two gardens. You can already start thinking through, okay, which two graves and which two gardens? We'll get there in just a minute. But when we talk about superheroes, let's go back to 2006 where it was Superman Returns. I don't know if you remember the film, but what happened was he did such this spectacular thing. It was a big airplane and it was crashing to earth and he's able to get out in front of it and slow it down. And right, he finally comes all the way down to this big giant stadium that takes place where all of a sudden he saves everyone on the plane and it, it, it lets it go back down. It falls down on, right in the middle of the stadium. Everybody starts applauding in front of everybody. That's what a superhero does right there. Jesus' story is a little bit different. Quietly, subtly, he comes back from the dead. Comes back from the dead and speaks to one woman and tells her, hey, go tell everybody else what you just saw. A little bit different, a little bit different. And what he's doing is he revealing himself because she doesn't recognize that it's him. She thinks it's a gardener. We'll read the story in just a moment. But what's fascinating by that is he's revealing himself. You would think, you would come back from the dead, I would, and just say, it's me, I'm back, you know, something like that. But instead, he starts asking her questions, allows her time to think and wonder and feel, and he gives you that opportunity this morning, that we get to come to him as thinking humans. We, we don't set our mind on a shelf when we, when we step into Christianity in that. He wants us thinking. He wants us feeling. He wants that. Matter of fact, there's different things that come out in the story that I, I won't read, but I'll tell you up front where two guys are running to the tomb, they go and they look inside, but in the Greek language that it was written in, it's not that they just see something, it's where it's a thoreo is a Greek word, but it's where we get our, our word to theorize, they're, they're thinking it through. What happened here? Did somebody just steal the body, but why, why are the cloths still there? If you're going to steal the body, wouldn't you take it cloths and all? Why would they unwrap him? That's weird. And, and they're just trying to get it because they didn't understand yet. And so we come to him with our intellect. We come to him with our minds and our hearts. We come to him with our questions. That's exactly what was taking place. And so we behold our gentle Savior. Yes, he is risen, yet he's still gentle in how he's displaying himself, how he's revealing himself to our friend Mary in the story. We're going to talk about death being reversed. There's a number of things that are reversed. But first, let's talk about those two graves in the two garden. The two graves, one is Adam's grave way back in the very first uh, few chapters of the Bible. And the other one is Jesus' grave. That first uh, garden is the Garden of Eden in the first part of the Bible. And the second one is the garden tomb. So those are what the two stories we're going to be kind of contrasting as we go through this. But Easter changes our lives. Easter changed everything. Easter reverses a number of things like sin's curse and death 
and condemnation. And so you see the scripture behind me. I'll read it in 1 Corinthians 15. The scripture tells us, and it draws this contrast also. The first, uh, the first man, Adam, that's actually the Hebrew word for man is Adom. And so that's where we get the word, his name, Adam. The first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a living, giving spirit, life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spirit body comes later. So on earth, we have this physical body, but we get a different body later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. And just as we are now like the earthly, earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. Russell Moore, he was the chief editor for, uh, is the chief editor, Uh, editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, he said this at the bottom of the screen there. One walks from a garden into a grave, that's Adam, and one walks from a grave into a garden, and that's Jesus. And so we're going to contrast what was lost in that first garden and was redeemed in the second garden, from darkness of the grave to the light of the resurrection morning, from the emotions of grief and confusion to ultimate awe and joy, from the Garden of Eden to the garden tomb. One of the things that we'll notice in our story as we read it now is alienation is replaced with connection. That a lot of times we feel we are alienated from God, sometimes from other, uh, other relationships. And so with that, I'm going to read in, chapter, in John, uh, the very end of chapter 19. It's a little bit of a section, but allow me to, uh, to read it to you and you can follow on uh, behind me there. But in chapter 19, it sets up our scene. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. A lot of times, you and I, when we think of gardens, if you've been to the cemetery here in Murrieta or in Temecula or forest lawns, you think of perfectly manicured, you know, guys running around with weed eaters, keeping it all nice in that way. That's not what's happening here. Where he dies, it's a very famous uh, uh, holiday. It's Passover, right? And they just want to bury him. They don't want to be dragging them all the way across the city or something else. It's right next door. There's a rich guy who has a garden. That would be like vegetables and fruit kind of garden. Kind. It's just a garden, right? And it's just right next door. He had hewn into the limestone a place for himself when he died. So it's never been used. It'll say that next. And with that, they go and they place him there. It was just convenience is what's happening. And that's why we're in a garden. But now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So it was convenience. It was just close. Chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple. Now it keeps saying the other disciple. We believe it to be John here who is writing this. And they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That's really why I think it's John. Because if you're a guy writing the story and you're on a foot race, you're going to tell that you won. Okay, verse 5. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And so he gets there first, just kind of looks in, then Peter comes up behind him. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded it in a place by himself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in when he saw, excuse me, for, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So they're perplexed. They're trying to figure it all out. They're, they're, they, they get it. They, they believe it. But they, they don't understand it fully. They leave. Who stays behind? Verse 11. We're going to ch- change that one. Thank you. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, so there's two angels there. Uh, we had that in your, in your questions there, the kind of a tr- trick question. But there are two angels in white sitting there. 
where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir... If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him away. And then here's the, this next verse that's really a, an incredible change of history here. And so we'll kind of slow it down into slow motion here. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. Obviously she was. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And they said, they, uh, it, excuse me, and that he had said these things to her. In the first garden, we found a man and a woman right? Adam and Eve. And here, once again, we have a man and a woman in the garden, but this time restoring all things. The woman in this garden, Mary, wasn't just facing a personal crisis. She sure shot, thought she was, right? Thought that that's what it was about. But it was so much more than that. A lot of times when you're facing a personal crisis, I wonder if we can ever just kind of pause for a second and say, could there be something bigger than just what I'm going through right now in this situation that's happening? What, what's, what's happening is it has to do with this ancient curse that came in that first garden when Adam and Eve fell, brought sin into the world <clears throat> and death because of that sin. What Mary then sees is not just a happy ending to a story where she's been kind of watching it lived out, but no, what she sees is God reversing the whole story of the universe. Again, she hasn't understood it all yet, but that's what's happening. Now, Mary's upset. She's standing outside the grave when she saw the tomb rolled away, the, the stone rolled away, and looking at that, grave robbers. That's what, that's what she's thinking. She doesn't understand the whole resurrection here, so she's processing all of this. <clears throat> and so she's upset that the grave robbers had taken the body of the one that she had been, basically gave up everything for. And what the angels do is basically point her out of the grave and back into the garden so that she might learn about the reversal of the corruption, about what had happened, what had taken place. Now, we're all headed into the grave. That's where we're going as we live here on this earth. We're headed to the grave. We're headed towards that corruption. But our reminder this morning is, but the grave isn't the end. The grave isn't the end. The story doesn't end there as he's showing us in his resurrection, right? Right? The angel sent her out of the grave and into the garden, and in the garden she meets one who she thinks is the gardener, but he's not. He actually owns the whole garden, actually owns the whole world. That's, that's who she's meeting here. And in rereading in verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, teacher. There's so much that happens in that moment Again, I, I just see it in slow motion, where the world turns on this whole revelation right here. See, in this garden, he reverses the story of alienation. Remember, in that first garden, there stood a, a woman who had ate of the forbidden fruit, and so did the man, thus flinging all of mankind into sin and corruption and, and death, and it brought about alienation. Somewhat of an alienation from each other, and definitely an alienation from their God. And so they did what? They, they hid themselves. This is reversed in this other garden where Jesus doesn't come up and say, where are you? That's what God was doing, looking for Adam and Eve. Where are you? He was God. He knew where they were, but that's what he's calling out to them, right? And they're playing hide and go seek. But here he doesn't say, where are you? But instead comes right up to her and calls her by name. I know you, Mary. And by saying, Mary, he's revealing who he is, and all of a sudden her eyes light up. She probably grabs him by the ankles and is going to hold on. I'm not going to let you go a second time, right? And just holding on to him there. The way the risen Christ meets Mary is the same way. It's really the, the summary of the Bible. Do you know why? 
See, Mary has such an admirable character for sure, but she would have never found Jesus if he didn't come to find her. Because she was looking for a dead Jesus, she was looking for a human Jesus, and she would have never found him in that way. The only way we find Jesus, we come to a relationship with him, is when he comes to us. That's the good news of the Bible. Not us trying to find him, but him coming and finding us. That's the gospel story for all of us. Humanly speaking, faith is impossible. We need him. See, unless Jesus breaks through, unless Jesus opens your eyes, even your reasoning skills go nowhere unless he helps you because he's given you the mind to be able to, to, to think with. We also see that disgrace is replaced with grace. What Jesus is saying to Mary and to you this morning, it's about identity. As the greatest being in the universe, Jesus is saying, I love you personally, expensively, and eternally. Those are three great words, huh? Loves us personally, expensively, giving his whole life, right? And eternally. But by saying her name, Mary, again, revealing himself, but revealing herself at the same time. That's who she is, Mary. He's saying, I love you. He's saying, I'm not a dead founder of an ethical religion that you can somehow get to know me by following all of my rules. That's not it. I'm the living Savior, and you can know me. And you don't have to hold on to me right now, afraid that you're going to lose me again. Because I'm going back to heaven to sit at the right hand of God, and I'm going to be sending you my Holy Spirit, and then you will have me in a way that you don't even have me right now. Something better than Jesus being on earth with them. Which you think, what would be better than that? You would think, if I could just see Jesus, if I could just talk with him, have a conversation with him, ask him a couple of questions. Why are avocado seeds too large? Or, you know, whatever your questions are. And you can lay out your, 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 your questions with him and just be able to do that. He says, I got something better than that. Because while he was here on earth, he could only be in one location at one time. But as God, he's everywhere present. So going back to heaven, sending the Holy Spirit, we can have God himself living in each, each and every one of us as believers. That's why he's saying it's better. It's better that I go. That's what he was explaining in John's gospel earlier. Oh, and the more you know me, the more you'll really know who you are, Mary. When we don't have a relationship, Jesus, we all live under this shadow of condemnation. We live our lives actually hiding some of you are still hiding, just like Adam and Eve were hiding. How they hid, here's how I picture them. They're hiding behind some bushes somewhere, and they're kind of trying to slow down your breathing because you've been running away from someone. You, you, you're, tr you're trying to kind of just slow down, get your breathing going, okay, trying to remain perfectly silent, and maybe God won't find you. Maybe God won't notice you're behind that bush. That's what they're doing, right? Now, you're not hiding behind bushes, but you're thinking that you're going unnoticed, hiding somewhere in his, in his big world, hoping that God isn't going to see you. You're hiding behind that life that God has given you. But the good, good news of the gospel is Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and calling you by your name. He's saying, where are you, Adam, Sheila, Lucas, Anna? calling you, coming to you, knocking on that door of your heart, and calling you by name. See, we play even as adults, hide-and-go-seek from God, just like a toddler. It's fun when you play hide-and-go-seek with toddlers, because what do they do? They go stand behind a, a clear curtain, and it's the only bulge in the curtain, and they're trying to slow down their breath a little bit, and trying to remain as, as, as calm as possible. And they don't realize that out of the bottom, their toes are sticking out, and there's this big bump in the curtain, right, that hasn't been there before. And it's as silly as us doing the same thing with God, thinking that we're hiding behind our work or hiding in our homes or hiding in this big world of his from him. And he comes up and knocks on the door of your heart today and says, where are you? And then he addresses you by name. This morning, will you let God count Jesus' death as your death? We you let him count Jesus' resurrection as your resurrection? Let him reverse your story of condemnation for commendation. Let him reverse your alienation for connection with him and with others. 
Let him reverse your disgrace for grace and let him reverse really just your story. See, God reversed Adam's story. He reversed Eve's story and Mary's story and my story. How about reversing your story today? Now, usually with this many people here, there's a few of you sitting there going, Brian, you don't know my story. You don't know how bad I was or am. I got good news for you. Mary Magdalene that we were talking about once had seven demons inside of her. How you doing now? Demonized, a hopeless woman, and yet God reversed her life. And then God reverses her story to save the world. Not that Mary saved the world, Jesus saved the world. But this is out of anybody, not like Superman in a whole stadium full of people. He chooses this one lady to be able to say, go tell my brothers. These are disciples that have been following him for three years. Let them know what happened. Let them know that I am alive and that you met me and tell them. And they're to tell others, right? Mary went, took the good news to the men in hiding. And they took it to others who took it to others who took it to others. To where it comes down 2,000 years to somebody taking it to me. And this morning I get to take it to you. Sharing it with you, the good news. It doesn't matter how awful your story was or is, you're invited to reverse your life story today. Let me end with this in Isaiah 61 3. In 61, there, it talks about when Messiah comes, here's what he's going to do on the earth. This isn't how to, how to know to, to, what, what to look for when, when Messiah shows up. And so it gives a whole list of things. But it gets down, and in verse 3, it says that he will give you, one of the things Messiah does <clears throat> is gives you beauty for ashes. That word beauty in the Hebrew is actually a garland. And so pic, picture of, of, of all these beautiful flowers here and making a wreath out of it and placing it on your head. Or when you go to Hawaii, I don't know if they still do this, but you used to get off the plane, they would put a lay over your, uh, over your head, right on your neck there. And whatever ashes you have in your life to bring to God this morning, he hands you a lay, and then another lay, and another lay, and a, garden, uh, a, a garland crown, and, and places in it. He'll take all of your junk, all of your sin, all of your stuff, all of your ashes, and change it out, swap it out. It's the great reversal. And so this morning, give him your ashes. He'll reverse what you bring him and replace them with like the the ashes of fear with hope. The ashes of hate with love. The ashes of regret with new promises. The ashes of loneliness with divine friendship. The ashes of sorrow and sin with joy in God. The ashes of soul sickness with inward healing. The ashes of bondage with spiritual liberty. The ashes of unrest with heart's ease. The ashes of worldly envy with godly contentment. And the ashes of defeat with victory and holiness. The ashes of godless pleasure with a worthwhile life. See, God will give you beauty for ashes this morning. Simply bring them to him. This morning, maybe you've been hearing him knocking on the door of your heart, calling you by name and saying, today's the day. This resurrection day, it's a day of new beginnings. It's a day of fresh starts. And maybe it's your day. And I'd like to give you that opportunity to pray and say, Lord, I want you to come and live inside of my heart. Let's pray now. God, we thank you for exchanging beauty for the ashes of our lives. What a great deal that that you have made us to take all of our sin and junk and mess ups and to be able to bring it to you today. And you say you'll take it and give us a crown in return. Lord, I pray for those that are in the fellowship hall, those that are listening online, those right here in this room that are about to raise their hand, that are ready to and to be able to say, God, I want to make sure I'm part of your family. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to have a relationship with the divine, Lord, with you. I want this free gift of eternal life. If you'd like to do that, I'd like you to raise your hand in a moment to say yes to that. Simply yes to him. And I'd like to say a prayer for you in 
kind of sealing that deal, saying, yes, today, I want to be your daughter. I want to be your son. I want to be part of your family. If you'd like to be forgiven, I'd like to know that you have a relationship with the Lord before you walk out these doors, then do that today. Just go ahead and raise your hands. Let the Lord see your hands. See you in the back. Awesome. See you in the middle. That's great. Off to the side. Great. See you both there. Anyone else? See the little guy up here. Awesome. A couple, three, four in the back. Great. You guys in the middle there. Awesome. And I can't see you in the fellowship hall, but the Lord does. And online. That's awesome. Just make this a prayer. You can put your hands down now and just make this a prayer from your heart. You can kind of repeat it after me as, God, I am sorry for the sins that I've committed against you and others. Please forgive me of those sins. I receive you into my life. Thank you become, for becoming my family today, my father, that I could call you Abba. I can call you Daddy. Thank you for that. Thank you for making me your child. Thank you for this free gift of eternal life. Thank you for today starts a new day. Thank you for reversing all of the stuff and junk and past and making today a new day. Lord, help me walk now each and every day to become more like your son. Help me to learn about you, understand who you are. So continue to reveal yourself, Lord, to me. May I just fall deeper in love with you each and every day. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen.